Here, the scripture says, the book of Exodus says, Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. God made us in his image, according to his likeness, male and female. He created us inside both male and female to be spiritual warriors. And there is no greater fellowship than to know that you are fighting with somebody shoulder to shoulder to carry out God's mission on this earth. There's no greater love that I have than knowing that somebody worked together in this. And so let's, uh, let's read Jude chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who are long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. You have given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. You've given us what we need to be able to armor up. Lord, you don't pull any punches. You're, you're very real about the things that we encounter, and you always have the answers for us in your word to prepare us, to empower us, to be able to be victorious and to overcome. I ask, Lord, that you be with me today as I preach your word, that I would communicate it clearly, and that each of us, Lord, would really commit to being those who contend earnestly for the faith that's been once for all delivered to the saints. May you be glorified, Lord, through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Contend earnestly for the faith. There's, what I want to hit today on this is a little bit about the faith and then some, some key points. And there's a lot of points we could talk about where we ought to contend earnestly. But I want to hit these, these key points. The fact that there is a reasoned faith. Okay, it's one of the areas that we're really going to have to, in the trenches, dig in and fight in this. The gospel. The gospel of glory. Okay, to, to see Jesus as he is, seated on the throne. God's plan of salvation. Almost everybody out there is lying. We ought to contend earnestly for this. And then the principles of the new creation that are really flow from the gospel of glory of Christ. And again, it is a fight because fleshly man doesn't want to be a new creation. And so these are the things I want to hit uh, quickly this morning. You know, Jude here says his goal, you know, he's a, he was the half-brother of Jesus. He calls himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Okay, James was another uh, brother of Jesus and uh, elder at the church of Jerusalem. Jude just speaks of himself in that manner. But Jude wanted to talk about our common salvation. It, it's fun sometimes just think about all the great things we have in Christ. You guys like to do that? The blessings that God has given to us the, every day. In my prayers to God, I'm just thankful for everything he's given. It is awesome. And to talk about our common salvation, lots of wonderful things. And that's what Jude's was, intention was. He was making every effort to write about our common salvation. But he said, I felt the necessity. The necessity to do something a little different. To contend earnestly for the faith. I, th I think about contend earnestly. I will use the Bobcat football team as an example. We've gone through some, some stages, but the last number of years have really, the goal has shifted for the Montana State University Bobcats to, to bring home a national championship. And one of the things that you realize 
Well, I'll, I'll go back. Any of, some of you might remember Denarius McGee when he was quarterback for the Bobcats. They won Big Sky Conference championships a few times. But in Denarius McGee's senior year, they, they didn't even make the playoffs. And on his way out, he said something was interesting to me. He said, the guy, basically, the guys coming into this team, this is my paraphrase, they expected winning. They thought they would come in here and be a part of that, but basically they weren't, haven't been willing to pay the price. They haven't been willing to pay the price of what it takes to actually win. Then there were some really down years, and then new coach came in, and you've seen this, and the goal has become national championship. And one of the things you've heard, I've heard from these players is basically we have to get to the next level. We got to fight harder, day in, day out, weightlifting year round, these kind of things. We, to understand what it means to be the best. Now, brother, this is a this is a football game, for Montana State football program for Montana State University. And those guys understand that to be the best, they are going to have to step it up a notch. Now, if you lose a football game big deal. Put your head down. You, want, you, you don't get to hold your head as high around the community, but big deal. Now let's take physical warfare. If you lose a battle, what are you packing out of there? You're packing out body bags. All of a sudden, this is, this is a lot bigger deal, isn't it? So you think about it in a physical sense. When we're talking about war, war is not for sissies. What a joke, actually, what's going on right now in the U.S. military. I'll just say that. You're allowing homosexuals, transgenders, all that in there. What do you think is going on inside the core of that military? They are stripping away, step by step, stripping away any toughness to contend earnestly. It's happening. Now let's take it up one more notch, which is where the Holy Spirit is through Jude. What about spiritual war? The body begs, this is eternal. Eternity is on the line for every soul. It's a deadly spiritual war. If you lose this and anybody around you loses this spiritual war, they are being destined for hell, away from the presence of God for all of eternity. I see in my mind spiritual body bags going away for eternity. That should hit you. How serious is this war? What's it mean to contend earnestly? I'll just say this. I'll speak for myself. Got to continue to be more serious about the nature of this spiritual war. And if we want to win one more, we got to realize the intensity of the spiritual war. Our school kids been memorizing Jude. That's where this message actually came from, this section here in Jude. And in many aspects, I know it wasn't just me, Davis and I had some conversations, this, this theme of contend earnestly, like it really struck us, the nature of the spiritual war. So I want to just share that with us today. To turn it up, Jude goes on and he says, you know, talks about, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. Just briefly want to mention you know, faith in the world's usage is often misused and it's more in place of blind hope. That's not what we're talking about. And, you know, in the religious world, various faiths, that's not what we're talking about. And the Bible speaks of faith and even speaks about faith at a personal level. But that's not what we're talking about here. What, he, what we're talking about here is the faith. I'm not preaching today on the faith of Christ, but I will say the law of Moses... The law of Moses in the Old Testament, Scripture would say unalterable. 
Every transgression received a just recompense. The law of Moses was not, could not be edited. Now, we've received something greater. The faith of Christ. Hey, there, we see in the Old Testament, people had faith. Abraham and his faith. David and his faith. But leading to what the New Testament, what Jesus gives us, what he relays to us is the faith of Christ. And it's not just a personal, well, I'll get in. It's not just a personal experiential thing. This is, in a very large sense, this is the system, the process that God has in place for any human being to actually be able to be born again and to be changed in the very likeness of Jesus Christ. This is what we're talking about. And so there's some places, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 talks about acting like men. Um, stand firm in the faith. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, I just want to turn there really quickly. Galatians 3, 23, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed and then Jude 1, 3, the faith which once for all has been handed down to the saints or delivered to the saints. Once for all. You know, one of the things I've noticed is people want to, well, let's just, let's just pick on uh, our country for a second. The Constitution of the United States, a rule by law, which is really a great system, by the way. Okay. Takes away the, removes the whim, whatever whim the, the ruling power has. It says that, no, there is something here that governs the government. But what do you hear about the Constitution of the United States? What, a word I hear a lot is outdated. Outdated. That, you know, that was made for the little rural type stuff. That would, that would never work. People want to change it. And the reason they want to change it is because it's not, comp I mean, there's a lot of factors in this, but no government wants to be governed. It, it's not comfortable when the government is chained down by the Constitution. And so there's a lot of appeal out there, and people buy the garbage, oh yeah, this wouldn't work, this wouldn't work. They want to change it. Well, what about the scripture? Let's, let's just a couple controversial things. You know, the scripture blatantly says that homosexual, homosexuality is a sin. It just says it. You can't, I, I've heard people try to get around that. You can't get past Romans chapter 1 without seeing this flat out says it. Well, that might be considered hate speech. So we got to change that. The Bible actually says that you should spank your kids. It says that. You go to any university across this country, and they're going to tell you, you never, ever, ever, ever spank a child. Now, I'm going to stand on this because this says it, and I also look around and I say, well, how does this other stuff work? Not very well. Okay. We could go down the line. Okay. But... This is once for all delivered to the saints. That means there, it is non-negotiable. The faith is non-negotiable. Nobody gets to edit it. Nobody gets to change it. As a matter of fact, God has made this completely unalterable. And if you want to edit it, what happens is, is you're, if you're editing it in your mind or as an organization, you just stepped, you just removed yourself from the faith. You didn't change the faith. The faith doesn't change. Non-negotiable. Not open to personal interpretation or modification. It's amazing the, the mental gymnastics that we are capable of within our brain to justify what we want to do. And all of a sudden, scripture that is actually really straightforward becomes really complicated. We can't quite figure out what it means. The faith, non-negotiable. Not open to denominational distortion. 
the Apostle Paul, both to the Corinthians and the Galatians, he talks about a different gospel. It's distorted, stretched. It's been changed. That is not the faith. And brethren, I'll just say this right now. Every single one of us who's been immersed into Christ, who is a Christian, we need to have an attitude, a mentality that as long as we are alive, this congregation that we are a part of will not cave on what the scripture says. Every one of us needs to have that. Jesus has a question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? I can only answer this for myself, but I want you to answer for yourself as long as I am alive. Yes, Jesus Christ, when you come, you will find the faith on the earth somewhere. Contend earnestly for the faith. We will not back down on what the scripture says. Whatever the New Testament says, that's what goes. You guys know I, I like the, the bumper sticker. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I don't really like the bumper sticker. I like it better modified. God said it. That settles it. Whether I believe it or not doesn't change. That's the reality. I actually had a girlfriend in college who was a, not a, she came from a Christian background. I use those in quotes. And we went over and over and over again what the Bible says about salvation. And one of her hang-ups was, my parents, my parents will never accept this. Well, for one thing, how do you know unless you show them? But what difference does it make? Whether her parents would look at the scriptures and say, oh, I don't believe it, I don't buy it, doesn't change their position where they are with God. God said it, that settles it. Then we can say, I believe it, the faith. So there's some areas, brethren, that I are particularly important that I want to hit on today in this spiritual war. One of these is a reasoned faith. You know, they, there is tremendous pressure. You, I, I put this picture up here on purpose is it emotions or you can go with emotions or with the brain now I'm not against emotion the heart is important and even the way that we that the world misuses the term heart but emotions are important but they got to be governed by the mind I think one of uh, Yolo's lessons is mind over heart it's entitled in, in that God starts with the mind. And we got to be really real about this. When, as we are contending for the faith, we are contending for a reasoned and reasonable faith. Emotional or experiential faith reigns supreme in our chaotic culture. If you're out there in the trenches, you're out there working with people, one of the huge barriers that we encounter is getting people to make a logical to reason logically and to make decisions based off of, a lo off of logic rather than emotion. It's, it's everywhere. Even, I'll, I'll say, most of us can see it in the political realm pretty well. What do the liberals always appeal to? I'll just say their words would be, it's, it's compassion. Compassion. We got to do this. And so they get people emotionally charged to do something without stepping back and saying, is this right? Does this make sense logically? That's the appeal. And it's the same way in, in the spiritual realm. Francis Schaeffer in his series, How Should We Then Live? One of the things he talks about is drug culture. When drug culture came into the United States, late 60s, something dramatically shifted. And one of the things with drug culture is you find the truth inside your own head. Now, brethren, that's not just drug culture, although our, I will say our culture right now is so prevalently on drugs that it's not surprising that that's the way people think. I will say any of us Christians who are dabbling in drugs, we need to think about that is a means by which Satan gains control of your mind. And he chips away at your ability to make logical decisions rather than emotional. The, the truth inside one's own head. 
And that, that never going to work. I actually had a professor of chemical engineering. I really liked this guy. He was, he was a Bible believer. And again, I put quotes in that. But he would sneak stuff in as he's teaching us. You know, he'd be like, well, this is an interesting thing. Water. You know, ev everything else, when it gets cold, what does it do? Contracts. What does water do when it gets cold? It expands. I wonder why that is. I mean, it, it makes it so everything can stay alive. And, the, you know, it's almost like some things were designed. You know, he would always be working those things in. But, but my, this professor and I, we got to have some more pretty in-depth, not super in-depth, but much more in-depth than that, spiritual conversations. And interesting, very, very logical man. Not only was he, did he actually became the department head uh, years after I left of chemical engineering, but he was in charge of all the computer stuff, and he was just a super logical guy. But he was Pentecostal. And one of the things I asked him, I was like, asked him some questions about his faith, and he basically said, These are, this is my paraphrase of it, but what jumped, stuck out to me is when I enter the doors of a church building, I check my brains at the door. Now, wait a second. Outside, he could say, yes, this is real, this is true. But then he's going to come in, and he is going to open himself up totally to experiential. Whatever he feels, and the brain is going to be checked at the door. That did not make sense. Now, that is a culture, though. That we fight. You ever wonder why so much the, the worship music is so much a part of all of these mega churches? Because they want you to experience God. They want you to feel. There's an emotional high that comes out of there where you felt close to God. And what they have done is removed this underlying philosophy of making a logical decision about whether or not what I'm hearing is true. Very fundamental that we need to be willing to take a stand on. You know, God says it this way, Isaiah 1, chapter 1, verse 18, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. God starts with the mind. From the mind flows everything else. You know, one of the things that was interesting to me uh, the movie Case for Christ. How many of you have seen that? I mean, there are a lot of things I like about Case for Christ. In, in there, Lee Strobel, the husband, is going out to, to disprove Christianity because his wife becomes a, and again, I'm using all these quotes today, but becomes a Christian, and he's feeling pressure that you know, his life has forever changed, so he's going out to disprove it. And along the way, every step that he goes, it's like, wow, the evidence is overwhelming. The evidence is overwhelming. The evidence is overwhelming. So he finally, at the end, I'll just say he cracks because of the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And but one thing Brian Schweitzer had said to me that I really appreciated when, after Brian and I had seen that together, he's, and he wanted to make sure that the young people in this congregation understood this, as that side of it was really great. But if you think about it, one of the things that that movie, Case for Christ, was pushing on the wife's side, why did she become a Christian? Because of what happened to her daughter. Her daughter was, was rescued from choking to death, and there was this emotional thing that she got, and that's what locked her in. And her whole faith was based off of that emotional decision. And in, one thing that does come through in that movie subtly is that that has just as much validity as a reasonable faith. I want to rewind the tape on that because there are Mormons who have had quite the experiences and their faith is not valid. There are Native Americans who have had quite the experiences and their faith is not valid. Experience cannot dictate reality there has to be underlying truth that we come to and that's why god would say come let us reason together that's where we start from i like the way proverbs 28 verse 26 says it he who trusts in his own heart is a fool but he who walks wisely will be delivered 
We are told in this culture, follow your heart, follow your heart, follow your heart, follow your heart, follow your heart straight to hell. Very fundamental that we need to do that, we, again, when you're out there in the trenches, you real, realize the importance of this, and we got to start by proving the Bible is the word of God. There is an absolute authority that is bigger than what you feel. Now, you've heard me say this, but I am very, very thankful. The proof that this is God's word, when it comes, when there comes up to something here and it pierces my heart, I know right away, I don't need to argue with this book. Well, maybe this isn't true. Maybe that's off the table. There's only one place for me to go, and that's start arguing with my heart. Because my heart's wrong if it doesn't match up with what this says. Very fundamental. We got to contend earnestly for this, brethren. Gospel of glory. Contend earnestly for that. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. You know, it, it's, uh, it's interesting to me. Human beings, I'll just put this, fleshly man, Fleshly man can acknowledge Jesus in the flesh. Whether it's his birth, you know, many people are still willing Christmas time. Oh yeah, that's a nice story. You know, the what was the what was the kids' cartoon movie that came out this year on Christmas? Anybody remember? It was last year. I don't know. I I think we watched it at school, but anyways. Mr. Ash, did you remember what you showed your Oh, was that last year? The, was the star or was that this year's version? Anyway, the star. It's a nice story, right? And everybody in this little cartoon version of Jesus, and it's a really cute story, and it's, there's a lot of truth in it. But the star is not going to convict you of your sin. The star is not going to get your mind fixed in the right place. I've told you guys before, the passion of the Christ. You can see Jesus going to the cross, and it is designed to convict people. And people are convicted. It's, wow, I don't care, one guy, I don't care who you are, Luke, that, that impacts you, what he went through. Now, that's part of the, the gospel message. But fleshly man wants to leave Jesus in the flesh. Our, our subconscious is really amazing. Okay? When you start being honest with yourself, when you figure yourself out, you ask, why do I do some of the things I do? Or why have I done some of the things I've done? The subconscious is always working. And it's amazing. I'll, I'll just say this. One way. When we, look, when we recognize subconsciously the value at which our money the, the means by which our money is losing value, the rate at which our money is losing value, there's a subconscious decision, spend it. Spend it now, because it's going to be worth less tomorrow than it is today. And so people spend it. You don't have to think th through all that. You just, everybody out there says, I'm going to spend this today. It used to be a bad thing. If money's burning a hole, your hole in your pocket, today you're saying, that's the best thing you can do with it, subconsciously. And people are doing that. Subconsciously, Fleshly man, there is a war within us, the spirit versus the flesh. And I'm, I'm just going to even say from a non-Christian perspective, people fighting against being spiritual creatures. And the mind set on the flesh, the scripture says, is hostile toward God. It's an enmity with God. And so one of the things that, that fleshly man does is they want to leave Jesus in the flesh. I remember years ago, I got to go to the prayer clinic. I think Jerry Hoffman was probably there that year. I, I remember most of my experiences, my memories of the prayer clinic. You were there. My dad was there. But there was a guy who, well, I like the way Steve Doty said it. Back east in, the, in this group, he's like, to my dad, he's like, these guys are the best of the best, right? They're spiritual guys. But I remember the conversations that we had, and there would be an uproar. 
a fighting against Jesus, the picture of him in glory. I remember a guy vehemently arguing with Jeff Hostetter and me about when Jesus comes again, he's going to see the imprint. Now, wait a second. And I've heard the, you, you ever heard the Christian songs like that? They're all over the place, right? But wait a second. I thought the scripture says flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fleshly man fights against that. And we ought to be willing to take a stand and contend earnestly to help people see Jesus as he really is. There are three phases of Christ. My dad had done a great job in the, in the cleansing of the inside of the cup book laying this out. Jesus in the flesh, it's important. Super important. He, anybody can read the Gospels and can be convicted and like, this guy knows me. Jesus in his recognizable resurrection. By many convincing proofs, Jesus appeared over a period of 40 days. Important. The same guy that went to that cross is the same guy who is alive today. That is important. Fundamental for any of us if we're going to believe in our future resurrection. But that's not the end of the story. The rest of it from Acts through Revelation. I even like the way Acts starts. Luke says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. What's that tell you about here? He's going to tell you what he continues to do and teach. Jesus on the throne. I like the way that Romans 8, 33 and 34 says it. Christ Jesus, he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Brethren, this is a part of this spiritual war that we got to stand on and be willing to contend earnestly for the faith. How about this one? God's plan of salvation. We got to contend earnestly what the Bible says about salvation. The reality of it is that most what's being taught out there in the churches is false teaching. Just give you a couple of, put it in these terms. Even in that movie Case for Christ at the end, what the woman says is, believe and receive. Her husband says, okay, what do I do? Believe and receive. And she quotes a little passage out of John chapter 1, or they turn there. But that's the end of the discussion. There is no discussion on what scriptural faith is. There is no discussion about what that term there even means, receive. There is no question about what would the terms of salvation be under the new covenant. It is that is the one thing that bugs me so much about that movie. I love it overall. But how this guy, so logical, 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 where does it go? Where does the truth send you? Where, okay, now I'm here. And the truth has led me to, this is legit. And now the search stops. The, the critical search stops. You know what I'm saying? Like, that doesn't make sense. We want to follow through. What does the Bible say? So oftentimes I hear about accept Jesus into your heart. You guys read this book? You ever seen that in there? Never seen it in there. The sinner's prayer. You know, the end of everything. I remember when I had cancer, a gal who had a Bible said, well, she would actually become a Christian. But she was a new Christian. She was trying to be nice. My dad might remember this, Connie. She had brought me a little pamphlet just trying to encourage, and I think it was Max Lucado, actually who was former church Christ, okay? But at the end of it, at the end of Max Lucado's thing that she had brought me to encourage me was a sinner's prayer. Guys, that's not in the Bible anywhere. We ought to contend earnestly for the faith. People are being lied to. And I'll tell you, again, when you're out there trying to help people become Christians, I'm going to just brag on Alina for a second because I know a little bit of the story, but I appreciate Recently in the study that Alina had, she drew a line where the scripture drew the line and would not back down. Now, at this point in time, that person chose not to be obedient to the gospel. Door isn't closed as long as that person's breathing. But I will say, there is nothing easy about that. You would, it's much easier to be the nice person and kind of leave it vague and beat around the bush. And you are never going to save anybody's soul by doing that. You have to contend earnestly. Where the scripture says it, you draw the line and you don't back down and you do everything within your power to help them see what it says. Now, if they opt out, you did your job. But you contend earnestly for the faith. We know what the scripture teaches about this. 
under the new covenant, the first step is believe. And we got to repent. By the way, I'm going to throw this out there. Repentance is a change in thinking, right? It includes changing your religion. Those Jews on the day of Pentecost, they were stuck in a way of thinking religiously. And when they had to repent, they had to change that religious way of thinking in order to become Christians. Confessing Jesus as Lord. I'm not going to speak too much on that today, but one of the requirements. And then, of course, being immersed into Christ. I want to hammer on this one for just a second because this is where in the trenches it gets really real. It's amazing to me. The, I think this is in the, in the Plan of Salvation booklet that I just transferred to, um, to PowerPoint. But, you know, you can, you can say this Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, what covenant was he under? A new covenant. So can anybody be, are we under the same terms? Can anybody be saved without believing in Jesus? And then we go to Acts chapter 2. Repent. What, what covenant were those people on the day of Pentecost under? New covenant. Actually, the first time the new will had been read. Are we under the same terms? Yep. Can anybody be saved without repenting? Nope. And then what about the Ethiopian eunuch? The necessity of confessing Jesus as Lord. What covenant was he under? New covenant. Are we under the same terms? Yep. Can anybody be saved without confessing Jesus as Lord? Nope. Then Acts twenty two sixteen. Saul is recounting what his conversion on the Damascus road. He believed, repented, and confessed Jesus as Lord. And yet you get down to verse sixteen, and what are you waiting for? Arise and be immersed and wash away your sins, calling on His name. Was Saul under the terms of the new covenant? Yep. Are we under the same terms? Yep. So can anybody be saved without being baptized into Christ? I'm not sure about that. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I can't tell you how many times I had this happen. Boom, 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 boom. Logical, 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 logical. Ah! Because there is a fight against this, a concentrated, concerted effort by Satan to misteach people about what the scripture says concerning salvation. We ought to contend earnestly for the faith. I, I will say in passing, I remember, this will always stick with me. I've seen a bunch, different tracks, different things. But Faith Chapel, they have a class. Faith Chapel, the biggest megachurch in Billings. And they have a class before people are baptized. And in this class, one of the things that their, their notes say, it, the question comes up, well, why be baptized since it has nothing to do with salvation? Because that's what they teach, that it has nothing to do with salvation. And then they give their spiel of why you should do it, even though it has nothing to do with salvation. But they, one of the things they quote in there is Acts 2.38. This is what they say. Peter said to them, repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, period. They didn't even do a dot, dot, dot. They put a period. We all know that's not where that verse ends. It is just straight lies. Deception from Satan. We got to contend earnestly for that. People are going to hell because this is what they're being told. We got to get out there and push back and show, show this is what the scripture says. Contend earnestly. Again, you will have people mad at you. I remember a guy years ago said, you got to risk the relationship to save the soul. And, I, and I'm a relationship person. But one thing I realized is if their soul isn't saved, that relationship's going to come to an end anyways. If they become Christians, that relationship will endure forever. That's what I want to help people do. So I encourage us, contend earnestly for the faith. What scriptures say about the new creation? You know, there are a lot of false teaching out here, and I'll just put it this way. Pe people who don't want to become like Jesus... There are two ways. One is license. Actually, that's what Jude's talking about. They turn the grace of God into licentiousness. Do whatever you want. And you're okay because the blood of Jesus covers you. Doesn't matter if you got, went out and got hammered last night. You're okay. Once saved, always saved. Nothing. 
you're okay. Do whatever you want. I mean, try to be a little better. And then there's law. We, say, that we know that doesn't make sense. Cheap grace, right? So we're going to come back and we're going to hit by law. You got to do and thou shalt not do. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. How's that work? Scripture says no value against fleshly indulgence. Neither law nor license works. There is one way that works. I like the way he says it in Galatians chapter 6. Neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And he says, whoever will walk by this rule. Peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. There is one rule for the Christian. New creation. Understand who you are. Now, this is fought against for, again, a number of reasons. And one of them is people who don't really want to become like Christ. The other is people who just don't think a person can actually change. I was Bible studying recently with a person, and I'm just going to leave it in general terms. They said to me, they basically said this, this kind of sin, a person can never change from that sin. And I said, I don't believe that for one second. I said, if I did, I won't be here. Where, where are we going to draw the line? You can't change. You can never overcome. Now, wait a second. I thought Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Well, he did, but not in my life. You know, Jesus is stronger than Satan everywhere but in here. That's wrong attitude. And sometimes it's like, well, in here, yeah, but, but not in there. That's wrong attitude. Brother, if we are going to contend earnestly for the faith to get out there and put our lives on the line for what this says, I got to believe every single word of this. I got to believe that I can walk into any home with anybody, no matter what their problems are, no matter what their past is, and say, Jesus has the answer. And I will stand firm on what the scripture says. Jesus can change anyone. He can take away our past. Therefore, if any... Well, I'll start verse earlier. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Do we believe that? Is the past gone? Are there new things that Jesus is building? This is, guys, this is the good news. Not just that we can be forgiven, but that God is changing us to be like Christ. That's power. What the song that you, one of the songs that Mr. Ash had led this morning. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. That is true. But the, the right hand of God, the arm of the Lord, he will not fail you. Now, you're going to find yourself taking some strong stands on this, contending earnestly. This is the means that God has to change us, flowing from who Jesus is. We know 2 Corinthians 3.18 Beholding is in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. It is the Spirit who is doing the transforming work in our lives. But we have a responsibility to believe what he says, to renew our minds. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I don't know if, how many of you guys remember, I just lost his last name. Rich from the congregation in Billings. He came, and I think he got immersed here actually at family camp. I know he did. Okay, one. And uh, shortly before I moved away from Billings, he died, died of cancer. But I remember Rich getting a hold of what the scripture said and Galatians 2.20, because this guy, he had a past just like everybody. Galatians 2.20, he, 
he took a hold of that, he grabbed a hold of that, and he ran with it, and he held it all the way through the finish line. It is no longer I who live. I, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Does scripture mean that? If you don't make it to glory, you better believe the scripture means that. We got to contend earnestly, brethren, for what the scripture says about the new creation. Wrapping it up here, we know we're in a deadly spiritual war. You see people dying. I, I, my brain fights against this. My emotions fight against this. But I got to see people in a very real spiritual sense with them being on fire. It, it gets me to go back one more time to somebody I care about. It's, if they die in their sins, separated from Christ, apart from being immersed into Christ, they are headed to the wrong place for eternity. Got to be real about this. We got to contend earnestly for the faith. A reasoned faith, important, brother. You got to start here. Everything else going to cave under pressure. What? Heard a little bit of Mr. I actually snuck out of Mr. J. Wilson's class, but I heard what he started talking about. When it comes to whether or not you're going to eat or whether or not you're going to cave, you know, the digital currency that's coming, they can. They proved to us what they can do with the truckers, right, from Canada. Freeze those assets whenever they want. Most people going to cave. Now, brother, every one of us today, whether we know it or not, we're preparing for those times. We're either preparing to lose because we cave on the little things. Or we're preparing to win because we stand where the Bible stands. We will not back down. We understand the importance of this. We don't get nicey-nicey, beat around the bush, pat somebody on the back on the way to hell. We say, hey, I care about you legitimately. I care enough about your soul to tell you the truth. And what the scripture says, that goes, and I'm willing to stand here, and I'm willing to help you make it. Anything else, brother? Ain't going to work. Jude was motivated. He said, I wanted to write about our common salvation. I'd, I felt the necessity to write that you contend earnestly for the faith. A reasoned faith, starting spot. If we don't start here, nothing else sticks. Gospel of glory, who Jesus is, what the scripture actually teaches about salvation. This is one where you'll feel it most often when you're out there with people. They'll just fight you on this tooth and nail. Many of us, how, I don't know what the count would be of how many people I've studied with that haven't made it compared to how many I've studied with that have. But I know this, there's only one way to help save somebody. And you've got to go through a lot of people that don't do it. Don't quit. You're, you're contending earnestly for the faith. Some will. Some will. And what the scripture says about the new creation. Brethren, let's contend earnestly for the faith so that we can win one more in 2024. Let's stand. I will say I appreciate all of you guys because... We're in different, oftentimes we're in different places in this. We, when we get the opportunity to sit down face to face with someone, that's awesome. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? But also, when we assemble on the first day of the week and we partake of this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And we are saying collectively, we contend earnestly for the faith. I love you guys because we are fighting together in this spiritual war in with the help of Jesus Christ, we will not back down. When he comes, he will find the faith on the earth. Amen?